Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the Friends of San Pedro Valley Park this evening. I'm Mila Stroganoff, Programs Director and for Field Trips Director for the Friends. I'm your host tonight, and we have an excellent program this evening. And I'm thrilled that Bill Lycom, our speaker tonight, has agreed to join us and present. Before I introduce Bill, allow me to give you a heads up regarding our upcoming program in January. We will have Morgan Stickrod, an excellent botanist and biologist, with us. He will give us a program on the flora in San Pedro Valley Park. This lecture will take place on January the 13th at 7 p.m. in webinar format. Morgan Stickrod has become well known to us, has given us several truly informative and fascinating lectures. His presentations are thorough and the photography are absolutely smashing. So for the botanists out there, make a note and for anyone else who's interested, please make a note on your calendars and remember to join us. I'm not certain and I can't say at this point whether or not we will be able to record it. Um, but tonight's lecture, we will have at the end, as usual, a Q&A session. So we'll take some questions at the end as, as much as time allows. I'm pleased to note too, that today's lecture will be recorded and posted to our website. So if you miss any part of it, or if you wish to let your friends know all about it, please do. We will have it up probably in a couple of weeks. Um, so if you wish to check our website, it's friendsofsanpedrovalleypark.org. Dot, dot org. So friendsofsanpedrovalleypark.org. Consider becoming a member and supporting the programming. Um, and now, I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. speaker. William Lycom states that science has been an important thread throughout his life. He has conducted research on the behavior of the gray fox. 13 years ago, he began documenting, photographing, and studying the behavior of the gray fox. This study resulted in the development of the Urban Wildlife Research Project, of which he is president and co-founder. His pioneering work has attracted a great deal of attention from the press, and there have been three documentary films about his work with the gray foxes. There has been a news article published in Bay Nature, a documentary by Siler Peralta Ramos. Excuse us, there's a phone here. Adrian's gonna take that. Um, a documentary by Siler Peralta Ramos, Stanford University, produced at Stanford University entitled, The Foxes, My Professors. He was a contributor to a field guide, canids of the world, wolves, wild dogs, foxes, jackals, coyotes, and their relatives by Dr. Jose R. Costello. And he's written a book entitled Road to Fox Hollow. I have this book. I purchased it recently from none other than the author himself. And I highly recommend it. It's available on Amazon. And uh, if you wish to have a further insight into gray foxes, please, please get a copy of this book. Support Bill, support his foundation, his Urban Wildlife Research Project Foundation and learn more about the wonderful life of gray foxes in none other than Palo Alto, really in our backyard. So Bill, please take it away. Okay. Well, I'm really happy to be here and uh, to uh, make uh, this presentation to take off on, uh, on the book a little bit you, you can also buy that book directly from me, uh, as I have uh, several copies here. And uh, you can do that through our website, the Urban Wildlife Research Project.org. And uh, just contact me directly through the website, and uh, we'll make arrangements and I'll get the book to you. 
It cost only $20 for this uh, uh, book. I, I don't know what else to say about it. Some people say it's a real emotional ride when you when you get to the, the whole uh, book itself. But that's not why we're here. We're here because uh, I want to give you a an introduction to the behavior of these remarkable uh, foxes. And so this is a year with the urban gray fox. And this is an ethological approach to uh, studying um, wildlife. And uh, so an ethological approach is the scientific study of animal behavior, usually the focus of behavior on, uh, in natural conditions. So it's like uh, with ethology, you, you have to be on the scene. You have to be uh, right there documenting their behavior as it occurs. And that's what I've done for the past 13 years to uh, two times uh, every day, virtually for 13 years. But let's get into the heart of this. Uh, first part I'm going to give you is like an overview of the uh, foxes. And then we're gonna dig in uh, deeper uh, with uh, video and uh, a, a lot of uh, really, you know, some people say it's really interesting um, information. So, in the beginning, uh, people would would say, "Well, how how can you tell uh, an urban gray fox from a wild gray fox?" Okay, let's assume that you're walking down a trail somewhere. Okay. And it's uh, in uh, the park. And uh, around the bend, uh, there's a gray fox that uh, you haven't seen yet. It knows you, that you're there before you know it's there. And so what this little gray fox will do is simply dash off into the brush and sit there and watch you walk by. Uh, and, and once you've walked by to a safe distance, the little fox will come right out of the brush and continue on its way, uh, doing whatever it was doing uh, before you came along. And the urban gray fox, on the other hand, is, is not that skittish. Uh, it has uh, usually, in, in most cases, the urban gray fox has grown up uh, in the vicinity of people and uh, our urban environment. And so it is used to seeing humans. And so it's not it's not as skittish as the wild gray fox is. Now, people get confused when they say, well, how can you tell the difference between a gray fox and a red fox, you know? Well, from a distance, you can tell because the tail colors are a good indicator. And uh, the, the uh, gray fox has a black tip on the tail. It's unmistakable. And the red fox, on the other hand, has a white tip on its tail. And you can see those from some distance. And so if you see a, 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 a a gray fox, you're going to see a black tip on the tail. And if it's a red fox, you're going to see it uh, as a white tip. Now, some some people uh, <clears throat> call baby uh, foxes kits. In England, they call them cubs. And I call them pups because they're of the canine family. And so in keeping with that, I'm going to, all the way through this presentation, I'm going to call them pups, okay? Now, when do they uh, show up, so to speak? Uh, they, they are not nocturnal um, because they are active at dawn. Um, they, 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 they will stay out in the open, um, when they uh, are not around human beings, okay, in, into sunrise, 
um, and some a little time after that, before they uh, have to go uh, to their sleeping uh, areas and uh, take a nap. The gray fox uh, doesn't sleep like you and I do. They're more like cats. They, uh, they, they nap uh, and then they move to a new location uh, where they have another place where they like to uh, rest. And this one uh, fox that uh, is sitting behind me here is uh, Limos. By the way, I, I name these foxes. I don't call them by their scientific, uh, by a scientific name. And uh, Limos uh, came into the area in uh, 2019 with his mate, uh, Big Eyes. And uh, they, so, so I, I, I can be down in the channel and uh, sun is up and the foxes are around. Um, and same happens with uh, dusk at the end of the day. They come out before sunset. So that's why we call them crepuscular and not nocturnal and not diurnal. My, my monogamous, most of the time they, they are monogamous and they raise multiple families of uh, pups. Uh, and uh, so this one uh, group uh, of foxes uh, that I called uh, Gray. Gray was the male and Mama Bold was the female of this thing. And they had five, uh, five litters of uh, pups and they were two of the best uh, um, adult uh, caretakers of pups that I have ever witnessed. They 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 really had their act. And I'll say more about that a little bit later on. And they have a cultural reputation too. Aesop, back about two thousand years ago or so, um, jotted down fables about uh, uh, they they were they were teaching uh, fables uh, for kids. Okay, but they, but Aesop uh, influenced uh, our ideas of foxes quite, quite heavily. Um, the sly fox, that's the one that Aesop just kept hammering away at. But the fox and the crow story goes like this. One day, or we, maybe we should say one evening, um, uh, the, the fox is out roaming around trying to get some food and his stomach is very, very empty and he's hungry, hungry, hungry. And so um, he sees this crow come flying in with a piece of meat in its beak and it lands in a tree just above. And so Fox says, oh, this crow, Crow, would you please, 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 would you sing for me? You have the most elegant voice in the whole of all the birds. Your, your voice is, is paramount. Would you please, please sing for me? And the old crow says, wow, nobody's ever said that about me before. Wow, I wonder what, what, what's this guy up to? And so... Fox keeps pleading with him. And after a bit, the, 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 the crow gets it in his head, says, huh, maybe I should sing for this guy. And so the crow opens his beak and lo and behold, the meat falls to the earth and crow and fox goes over, snatches it up and looks up at crow and says, beware of those who would flatter you. And that's the kind of teaching story uh, that we have coming down all the way to the present time. Now, the, 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 this, this gray fox is really unique uh, in uh, so many ways. First of all, 
it's what we call the basal um, uh, fox. It means it's it's the foundation fox. It's the one that uh, is the oldest, and uh, all the rest of the canines are youngsters compared to the ten million year old. Uh, genetically old gray fox. And here's a fact. If you ever see a gray fox out in the field, you're, you're looking at a genetic replica of gray foxes that runs back 10 million years. Now I say over here on the side, it's eight to 12 million years. Science, the, the researchers have not really gotten a firm grip on exactly how long, and they probably never will, but 10 million years is a good number to uh, go by. And uh, so the island fox and the gray fox, they're related to one another, and uh, they, uh, they are the basal um, fox. And I'll throw in another thing, too, about these foxes that is very unique. And it's that the gray fox is the only fox in North America that can climb a tree like a squirrel. I have seen them and we will see them later on in the presentation here of uh, doing just that, climbing trees. So Let's move on here. Gray fox range. A lot of people ask me, well, where are they? You know, well, they are native to North America and they're just about everywhere. But the white areas that you see there, they're, they're not in, the, in those areas. And uh, like, for instance, up there in Idaho and Montana, um, I uh, contacted a, a biologist at the University of uh, Montana uh, and uh, uh, I asked him, I said, why? Why are not why are the foxes not in this area? And he said, Every, we don't know. We don't really know why they're not here. And um, so it's a mystery. And I've been, I've been trying to approach that mystery a little bit, um, but uh, so far, no good. Um, so anyway, uh, that, that, that's their range. And if we go down to um, South America here, they're just at the tip of uh, uh, Colombia and Venezuela. And so uh, after that, the foxes that populate South America are a different genus, genus of, uh, of foxes. So let's move on. Submissive select gray fox behaviors. This the, the submissive happiness. When I first saw a, a gray fox swish its tail, I was amazed. I'll tell you, I, I had never seen such swishing. This is this is different than a dog wagging its tail. Very, very different. Um, and they just sweep that big tail back and forth, back and forth. And so the tail swishing and the ears laid back, like you see in the picture there, and the slithering body mo movement motions and the belly load, they give squeaking chirps. That is, uh, uh, a, in, the, in the picture there, that is a young fox um, approaching uh, the um, male alpha fox. And so it's giving respect to the to the uh, alpha fox, and it's happy. And th then we go over to the second one, and we have the fox kiss. When I first saw this, I was really, I went, whoa, look at that, look at that. And this is performed between uh, pup and adult, mate to mate. It's it's used in a variety of ways, um, uh, mainly uh, with mate to mate. It's a, it's a greeting. Maybe they've been out at night hunting and they don't hunt together. Okay, they hunt separately, and uh, maybe they've been apart all night long, 
And in the early morning, they find each other and they get back together. Well, one of the common things they do is give each other a fox kiss. It's a greeting. And so this uh, next one here is uh, a pup called Midget and his alpha male dad, it's his father, is uh, dark. Here's what happens. There's Midget coming into the scene. Midget wants all kinds of attention from, from Dark. And for once, Dark is giving it to him, He's paying attention to his pup. And Midget, Midget was a pretty incredible little guy. So here we go with comparative tools of perception. This tools of perception is my own uh, name for this, but it's the way in which we uh, come to understand the world around us. So if you look over there at the human tools of perception, dominating everything is our uh, sight. We navigate through the universe with sight as the dominant way of getting from A to B to C. And the rest of them, yeah, they're down there. But it's very, very different for the gray fox. Their tools of perception are hearing and smell. Okay, sight is almost non-existent. Touch and taste, yeah, those are things. But I had to draw this together um, out of my own because nobody has ever uh, uh, done any research to find out the actual numbers that uh, are there for uh, the gray fox and its tools of perception. Here we go again. The human hearing range 20,000 hertz yeah, and 6 million olfactory cells in our noses and one processing channel. Look at what the gray fox is all about. Hearing range 45,000 hertz. That's over twice as, as much. And 30, 300 million olfactory cells and two processing channels. They live in a different world from us. And I can say that without any hesitation whatsoever. Their world is governed so differently from us that they are, mm, I don't want to say alien, but they, but they are of a different kind. Now, vermin and the gray fox, ear cleaning. You see all that, those insects and things that are in the ears of the fox there? That blocks up that blocks their ability to hear. And so the foxes have, a, have a, a cultural practice of ear cleaning. One fox will clean the ears of another and it will return the uh, uh, process. It'll, it'll uh, clean the ears of the one that cleaned it. And most of the time, because it's all protein, um, they enjoy the taste of it. Hmm. So here's a, a little video uh, on uh, ear cleaning. We can see uh, cute uh, ear cleaning one of her pups. There we go. And see how she laps that up, that, that, that good protein that's in, in the ears. And so she's making it possible for that pup to be able to hear clearly. And the other, uh, on, a, on a completely different scale of things, 
um, lots of people ask me, well, what is the sound of, what, what, does, what kind of sound does a, 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 a gray fox make? And so I had a difficult time trying to imitate uh, how a, a fox uh, sounds. And so I just decided, here we go. We can't hear that, Bill. Can is it possible to put the audio up on the, um, on the bark and whistle? I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Okay. Um, shoot. Okay. Well, we're gonna. Uh, well. Yeah, I don't know how to increase the volume because all my controls are, are, are covered. We'll just have to skip that, I guess. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Here's a, here's how the, all of this is used. Now, that that fox there is a, is a red fox. But what it does is equivalent to what a gray fox will do too. I have seen gray foxes make this leap into the bushes, into the grass and so forth and come up with a rodent in its mouth. Um, observe the head movements of this red fox as it uh, uh, tracks the movement of a rodent in four feet of snow. And when I said that they, they, they are living in a different world from us, this is one example. It listens for the tiny sounds of its prey moving about below, but must take great care not to scare them away. That red fox comes up with a rodent and has a meal. Could you hear the narration? Yes, we did. Yes, the narration came out perfectly. Good, good. Okay, so the annual cycle, part one. Late November and into February, uh, the gray foxes, the young gray foxes are partnering, part pairing up, okay? And uh, what happens at night uh, is that uh, the um, uh, both sexes will call, I mean, they, they call sometimes all night long to try to attract a mate. When it comes down to the bottom line though, the female, is the one that accepts the male. The male has very little to do with it. She's the one that governs it all. And she is polyandrous, uh, which you can read there. Um, so uh, she, she is the uh, governing party to this relationship that uh, they are uh, entering. And so, one of the characteristics is before parenthood, they show a lot of intimate um, behavior toward one another. Like for instance, come on. Well, okay, there we go. That's the alpha male and this is cute, his mate. And cute on this particular day wanted some attention from uh, Dark. Dark was sometimes reluctant to give her any attention, but on this particular day, he did. 
and I caught it all on stills. And you can draw your own conclusions from what you see there. That's a, that's a pretty, um, I don't know exactly how to express that. But anyway, let's go on. Oh, wait a minute. Don't want to go there. Mama Bold in Labor and Den Movie. Would you mind if I took a short break right here? Go ahead. Sure. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay. Bill will be back in a minute. He's probably got to wet his whistle. So. Thank you. Anyway, uh, yeah, the, these these foxes grow up very quickly. Uh, Mama Bold in this uh, next video is uh, in labor. It's probably, I, I don't know of any other um, uh, uh, video that uh, has ever been taken of a gray fox in labor. But uh, what happened was that I knew that the uh, I knew where their den was and where she was going to have her her pups, and so I set I set up a trail camera uh, looking away from the den on a trail that I assumed she was going to take when she came back to the uh, to the den, and I did not know that this was going to uh, be a a, a, a video. Of, of labor. And once she has the pups and they have uh, had time in the natal den, then they move. She moves them to a new location. And we're going to see that here too. She moves them in a new location because I think this, uh, because uh, it's born into them that they need to keep moving in order to avoid predators. And so as that's especially so when the pups are small. So let's uh, let's uh, check this one out. I hope you can hear her. That's that's Mama Bold. That's just before she has gives birth to her pups. Now here, here she's moving them. Like I mentioned before, she takes them by the scruff of their neck, just like a cat would, and moves them off to a new den site. And it takes her all day to do this. So now she's, one of the things they do with their food is if they have too much food, they cache it. It means they bury it. And then they go back later, uncover it, and uh, have a feast. This, I believe, is a jackrabbit that she is feeding on. And she's done a lot of work already, so she a little snack break um, is a welcome
but Mama, but Mama uh, Bold um, doesn't just sit there and eat um, that meat. She takes it off to rebury it somewhere else, nearer to where the uh, the new den is going to be located. And just for your information, the new den was about, I don't know, 100 yards from where they were. And here, here are the pups. And after a long, long day of trying to get all five of her pups over to this new den site, she decided that uh, she decided that to try to get them to walk there. But they've never left their natal den. I mean, nothing very far. And so that little that little pup goes back over to where his sibling is or her sibling, and says, "You know, come on, we're gonna we're gonna go back home." Okay, this is this is too much out here in the in the environment. So Mama, in order to move those two little pups, has to go get them, has to go um, uh, car carry them back to the uh, new uh, new natal uh, the new den, and there she goes. And this is in their new den. They finally made it. I suppose they're happy. There's mama. And then just to see a little bit of, more about it, here's Gray, the male, and his pups. He took good care of them. I think he enjoyed being a father. And that's in contrast to gray, I mean, not gray, but uh, uh, dark that we saw earlier. Uh, I don't want to go there. There, that's what I want. Continuing with the, the young uh, pups getting to be uh, older, sometimes they run into situations like this. Ah, what is that? Oh, you've probably never seen a skunk before. Yeah, look at this. Yeah. And the old skunk goes, and decides to leave. So now they've been introduced to a new species in their area. And I'm wondering what they're what they're thinking about, you know, in terms of that new thing they saw. Anyway, pups nursing on Mama Bold. This is the way they nurse. And sometimes when you have five pups, there's not enough room under there. She, uh, Mama Bold uh, nursed her uh, uh, pups longer than most uh, females do. And so here we got a crowd and that one little fox got kind of pushed out. And uh, so it's going to go over over to there. By the way, I, I, I shot this with a handheld uh, video camera and uh, <clears throat> Sometimes it gets shaky. It's hard to hold still. Um, okay. And this one here, Cute Hunts a Tree Squirrel. The backstory to this is that I was checking on a trail camera that I had back in a, a riparian habitat, uh, a pretty big area. And um, 
Cute, uh, the, the primary fox here in this scene, um, was following me. He was, she was behind me with two other um, cubs. And so um, I noted that and I continued on to my trail camera and I was leaning over my trail camera to uh, uh, open it up. And I happened to just look up into this tree there was cute and obviously she was hunting. This is one of the behaviors of these foxes. Remember they can climb trees and they're very, very adept at doing so. And so let's see, let's watch uh, cute. And by the way, um, I had, uh, I, was, I was again holding this camera, trying to make it stable uh, but uh, it uh, was pretty difficult. So now she's drawing a bead on, it happens to be a squirrel that's up in that tree that she wants to get. So she jumps up there. See how agile they are up in, up in the trees? Ah, and that, that oh. oh, she fell. She fell all the way into that uh, uh, berry vine patch. There the squirrel, after escaping the, <laughs> after escaping, um, was uh, pretty happy about that, I think. And here comes um, the story of Daring. Daring was a pup. She was the alpha pup of the five pups of Mama, Fold, and Gray. And uh, Daring uh, got, uh, got attacked by one of the parents. I'm not sure which. Because one of the things she did to control the other four pups her siblings was to fight. Um, and um, none of them really liked um, uh, Daring very much. Well, she got into this, this horrendous fight and she lost the use of her hind leg. Now that hind leg is very, very important for climbing. Uh, it gives the push to get higher up into the tree. And uh, so she, that, that is one of the places where in a fox fight, the foxes will go to, uh, they will intentionally go to the hind legs or to the ears. And in this case, she got hit by both. And uh, in this particular high-speed climbing school, as I call it, um, Gray brought his uh, five pups through the grass right toward where I was standing with my camera ready. And this is what uh, occurred. They are about six months old here. And we don't get to see all five of them because they're kind of spread out, but there. Now this this is this is Derry. She's trying to climb the tree to be with her siblings, but her hind leg won't give her the push that she needs to get on up, and she has one floppy ear. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story because the rest of the story goes that um, she, uh, Daring, got ostracized by all of the other, all of her other siblings until she got well, and somewhere along the line she began to understand why 
her siblings were antagonistic toward her. And that changed her behavior forever. Because once she got to be well again, and that hind leg mended and the ear came back to normal, she um, no longer fought with her siblings. And so her siblings gave her back the alpha status. And so, you see that floppy ear? Somebody, somebody bit into that ear. Come on, guys. Okay. And here, here's uh, Mama Bold. She comes into the scene and Daring goes over to Mama. And Mama kind of pays a little bit of attention to her, but not a whole lot. So... The hierarchy. These foxes form a hierarchy of being all the way from uh, alpha uh, down to omega. Um, and uh, that means simply that the uh, 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 foxes, the young foxes, when they're first born and for some time thereafter, when uh, one of the adults brings back some food, the adults just simply drop it in the middle of nowhere. I mean, in the middle of the of the pups, and the pups have to fight over their food. And so, what happens is that the the one that consistently gets the food uh, more often than than not becomes the alpha uh, uh, pup, and later on in life becomes the alpha male or female. There are alpha females in the gray fox family too and so here's the fight so i'm sorry that's so bled out it could be colored So the, those two there uh, are the ones left over. I mean, that, that have the uh, rabbit in in their possession. And those two are going to fight to become the alpha of the pup world. And sometimes they don't get along with one another. Cute um, has a serious disagreement with uh, young Tense. Tense, Tense was the, the kind of a fox that was always looked like she was on the verge of, well, I don't, know, I don't know how to explain that exactly. She was tense all the time, okay? And uh, so um, she meets up with Cute, the two of them meet. So the one that's getting beaten up in that that little fight there uh, is um, that's tense, and the one walking away that's cute. So they have disagreements within their own uh, kind, but very few disagreements. Um, most of the most of the fighting. Uh, that goes on in the wildlife kingdom uh, is um, uh, between their own species. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't usually cross uh, very, very much anyway. So November, December, leaving home. 
they have to be they're they're like in some ways they're like late teenagers they got to get out of the house okay and so they uh they disperse but sometimes they don't uh make it uh, in dispersal and when that happens then the alpha male is the one responsible for chasing away all of the young foxes that will not disperse, that don't want to go, uh, you know, don't want to leave home. And uh, most of the time it's successful. In the story of Pale and Blackie, um, Pale was the female and Blackie was the male. And uh, Pale went off uh, to try to establish her own um, area and out there at the Palo Alto Baylands, uh, given the bigger picture of the Baylands out there, there's not a whole lot of places for them to go. And so one of the things that Pale did was she, she tried to establish her own territory. Um, and it was bordering on a uh, uh, the Palo Alto technology center it didn't work and so she came back home and when she came back home here's this little fox called that i called blackie because his face is more black than most uh, he's, he's got a black tinge to his uh, coloration and uh so uh pale takes up with blackie and blackie um uh, well, when she comes home, she first meets up with her parents, but then she meets up with Blackie. And Blackie was one of the most unusual little foxes I have ever, ever encountered. The very first time I saw that little fox, it was he was he was about oh I don't know uh, maybe 150 feet away from me. He saw me. I saw him, I started to take a picture of him, and he came trotting right up to me. Now, I never have seen that um, ever again. He came trotting right up to me as if to say, who are you? And so later on, uh, Blackie was hanging around and he'd follow me. And one morning I got back into my car and Blackie jumped up on the hood of the car and looked at me through the windshield. And I had to get out of the car and chase him off and get him away from the car so I could drive away. There are many stories about Blackie that are quite, um, I, I think are quite interesting. But when, when um, Pale comes back to meet with Mama and Papa, here's what happens. Whoops, come on. All right. Remember the description of reading in the beginning? He's squishing that tail. And gray, here gray goes back into the brush and leaves mama and uh, pale to themselves. These two, mama and pale, had a very interesting mother-daughter relationship. And so there's Blackie. And that pretty much ends the formal presentation of this. And I wanna read this to you. Science has clearly shown that we gray foxes and other animals that inhabit the night are not just hardwired critters running through the thickets on what you, you humans call instinct. We are sentient beings, thinking, feeling, conscious. We anticipate the future we think similar to you. We show affection for one another. 
We are sometimes jealous because one pup has more attention given. There are times when we are happy, while at other times we mourn our loss. Because we are in such close proximity with you, we lose our food supply and our homes because many of your fellow human beings fail to understand our needs and our lives. Instead of destroying our habitats, our corridors, our ancient natal dens, please help to preserve these regions and treat us with respect. In return, we will be a boon to the ecosystem as we work to keep it healthy for both humans and wildlife alike. Respectfully, Squat the Elder. And I'm gonna say a couple of words about Squat. Squat was the first adult um, gray fox that taught me the foundations of what it means to be a gray fox. And that's why in uh, my attitude is that um, they are my professors. I am in graduate school studying to become knowledgeable about them. And so that pretty much does the formal part of the show and uh, or the presentation. And uh, if you would like to um, visit our website, it's no longer .com, it's .org. And we have a lot of information up there and a lot of video, and lots of, of information that extends beyond this that I've given you this evening. So um, I'd just like to say thank you for your attendance and um, what else can I say? Well, Bill, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I have, I've only seen one fox and that was on San Bruno Mountains and I think it was being fed. And so it was always near the cars, the parking lot at the very, very peak of San Bruno Mountains where uh, and uh, it used to hang out there and, yeah. and I gather they uh, there there might have been a family up there that uh, bend um, it was a, a a little trail that went down from there and and then of course these foxes I'm not sure but it seemed as though they just moved on and so I was asking folks whether they saw the foxes again or the fox that was near the car, but it didn't. I never heard a positive uh, response in regards to that. Um, as one, far, as far as yes, I was I was going to say that once in a while they move on uh, when uh, the environment changes. For instance, if you have. Uh, coyotes moving into the area and also um, mountain lions because they prey on gray foxes. One added thing though about uh, gray foxes and uh, mountain lions is that uh, the gray foxes in the Santa Cruz mountain range, and I can only speak to that, uh, those gray foxes, they have learned that uh, if they uh, wallow in a uh, uh, a, a mountain lion's uh, scat or scent uh, where, where, where the mountain lion has uh, scraped uh, and left its scent, the uh, gray foxes will wallow in that, in that scent. And therefore, if they come upon, uh, oh, I don't know, like a, a coyote that might want to eat them, the coyote won't touch them because they smell like a mountain lion. And so it's a kind of defensive thing. Good, that good, good, good camouflage. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. did they learn? How did they learn to do that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. No idea. Let's see what some questions. Um, do you think? Well, we might. We definitely did have foxes in in san pedro valley park but i think probably again due to the coyotes and the mountain lions and the bobcats 
they've probably moved on too. Yep. Yep, probably so. Uh, let's see. So is uh, someone, one of the attendees is asking, is it hurts the range of hearing or the sensitivity? Say that again. Is hurts the range of hearing or the sensitivity? Um, hurts. When you said that. Oh, oh, oh her, yeah, the, her, the hurts level. The hurts level. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the hearing range. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. Okay, so there is a, they said in terms of, of uh, so my, Michael Hans was saying there's a Zoom audio setting for this. I'm, I think he's referring to the sound, um, but that's okay. And some, okay, and a Zoom audio setting for this. I, we didn't know that. Okay, I used to see Barbara Daly saying, I used to see a gray fox occasionally at San Pedro Valley Park, but not in some years. Are they still seen or were they victims of distemper? Well, uh, I don't know if they're victims of distemper, but I do know that uh, the foxes that uh, uh, were down at the Palo Alto Baylands in 2016, they were wiped out by um, uh, canine distemper. But the fact because they were all genetically of the same base, genetically the same, it it literally did wipe them out. I mean, they had nothing to fight with. Um, well, when, when canine distemper is is a very is a kind of unique uh, virus in in terms of it, it attacks it attacks the gastrointestinal uh, system the respiratory system, and the neurological system. So your one doesn't have a chance? No, they don't have a chance. Oh, God. There's no way. So that's that's why when uh, pups are born, uh, you always get a canine distemper uh, shot, an inoculation, um, because later on in life, uh, if they come down with canine distemper without having that shot when they were pups, uh, they will die. A hundred percent. I didn't realize it was that a severe um, uh, an illness that literally takes over the whole body. Yeah. Hmm. So all of the uh, and what happened to the dead foxes that you mentioned? I mean, yes, you found the bodies. Yes, you didn't find others. So um, did they go for a necropsy or? Uh... Well, we, 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 only had, we only had gray foxes out there at that time. So uh, what happened was that uh, when, when we first started to see um, the uh, foxes dying. Well, we had we had three foxes that were found dead. Okay, um, animal services for the city of Palo Alto um, contacted uh, the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife vet veterinarian uh, Deborah and uh, and uh, told her what the situation was, and she said, "If you have two, send them to me and I will do a necropsy. And she did exactly that and came back with, uh, they died of uh, canine distemper and they had other virus uh, viruses in their system as well, like toxoplasmosis. Uh, that was the most frequent other one. But toxo won't uh, necessarily kill you, kill fox. Mm. They just live with it. Ah. Um, uh, Bing is asking, are overall numbers in our area stable? So in the Bay Area per se, or 
in general, are Fox numbers stable or are they also going, you know, are all they all suffering also from canine distemper? Um, the great, we, the Bay Area, the greater Bay Area, okay, and that includes up in Marin County, over in the East Bay, and down in the area that I'm in, down in Palo Alto here. Mm -hmm. uh, that whole region is the uh, home of uh, the gray fox uh, Euroscience and Rail Argentinus Townsendi. And that Townsendi is a subgroup of other gray fox, uh, gray foxes. And uh, so those, those gray foxes uh, make their home around here and you can go you can go virtually anywhere and see or uh, know of uh, gray foxes being in the area and a lot of them are urban foxes um, I gave a talk up in the um, Berkeley Hills uh, in a residential area up there and uh, all the people who came had stories about the gray foxes in their backyards, gray foxes on their roof, the roof of their um, homes. And this one young man uh, said that uh, uh, he and his wife uh, have a, um, uh, what do you call that thing? Um, a sky, a sky, mm, I'm trying to get that out. Uh, Anyway, they could they could look up and see the a, a, a skylight. Skylight, yeah, 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 yeah. And and uh, so th they heard this noise up on their skylight that was over their bed, and uh, they looked up, and what was happening was that the the uh, foxes were using the skylight as a slide, and they climb up on top and slide down back onto the roof. And then they'd repeat that over and over. And that was what, what woke them up. And uh, I thought that was such an interesting story. But foxes are all over the Bay Area. Well, that's good to hear. I mean, it's good to hear that a particular species is thriving. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea of numbers? Uh, no, nobody has ever been able to assess the numbers uh, uh -huh. that I know of anyway. Um, and uh, Arvind is saying, thank you for an informative session. The videos and photos are priceless. And then, um, which is absolutely true. I did know that and Adrian does, and I'm sure everyone who's mm -hmm. listening. How are the female polyandrous? polyandrous and the males monogamous so the females uh just mate with more than one male and the males don't is that yep. that's it right that's it yeah mm -hmm. yeah the, the females are out to to see how many how yeah. many they can attract <laughs> yeah it has it has to do with the uh spread of the genetic um what do, what do I call it? The genes. Yeah, the genetic code that each male yeah. has and carries. It. Yeah. It keep it keeps the gene pool healthy. Right. So here, Judy is saying, Bill, we had two gray foxes in our yard last summer. They caught the squirrel eating our apricots by running up into our oak tree to catch it at seven thirty a.m. The rats in our yard disappeared and we think the foxes caught them. The pair of gray foxes played together in our backyard and we could see this on our video cameras. We also had skunks, raccoons, opossums in our yard at night. So they had a very, very lively place. Yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> are are there any in 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 with with four or five pups and and she says she lives in Oakland Judy does bill with four or five pups when they 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 have them uh, and they start growing up 
does what could one of them become more of a helper or an aunt that would okay. help that would help the mother and the father bring up the other pups yeah i i was the first one to document that the there are helper females within the community of the gray fox uh, extended families um and uh, so the uh, they they act uh, almost like uh, nannies. Um, they'll take uh, say you have uh, four four pups. Okay, they'll take two of those pups off and uh, kind of raise them. Uh, although there's still interaction with the maternal uh, pair, um, but uh, the the helper females are present in in the uh, community of the gray foxes so this would be the the generation that has all already grown up yeah yeah right yeah. and they they stay around in order to help with with bringing up the other the other pups yep that happens uh-huh there's uh, they, um, I have, I, I heard, I received an email from a lady who said that she had a family of foxes living under her house in Pacifica. Yeah. And that over a year of, um, uh, of following and, and, uh, following them, observing them, she noticed this particular trend that there was a helper amongst them that uh so i wanted to and she has a whole catalog of photographs and i'm not sure whether or not you she's interested to know whether you'd be interested in in touching base with her on this sure she can send an email to me okay then i'll t i'll put you two in in contact okay after the program uh-huh um, and Judy is saying thank you for the amazing videos. I think the the videos are something that none of us would have been ever able to see. So they are truly mind boggling. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. mind boggling. Uh, that that's that's just simply because um, you see, I, I'm the co-founder to this uh, to the Urban Wildlife Research Project. The other founder to the project is a guy named Greg. And uh, in, in the beginning, Greg was out there with me all the time. And one day he just said, we ought to get trail cameras in here. I had never even thought about trail cameras. And I was already almost two years into the uh, documentation of these uh, foxes. And so Greg and I dug in and uh, checked out what we considered at the time to be the best uh, of the uh, trail cameras, bought, I think, three of them and set them out. And from the rest of it is history. So I, I have now 14 hmm. uh, cameras operating uh, right now, at, tonight. 14. 14, yeah. That'll keep you busy going from <laughs> one to the other. Well, in the morning, uh, I will be out there at the Baylands before six o'clock collecting the SD cards from each one of the cameras. And um, then I bring them back here to my office and I process them, tag them and archive them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the present time, we have uh, a collection if you will, if you want to call it a collection, of uh, seven terabytes worth of data on the gray fox. Nobody else in the world has that much. Seven terabytes, that's mm. a humongous amount. Yeah. Bill, so it sounds like more foxes have moved into Palo Alto after you know the, the ones that died. Well, there there's only two. Um two. <laughs> to uh yeah um <clears throat> that that little gray fox is sitting behind my uh back there uh limos and his mate uh uh big eyes and uh they moved in 
um, two years and one month after the dieout. And uh, they have uh, uh, taken over the territory out there. And about three months into when they took over and marked their territory, uh, another little gray fox trespassed on into their territory. It took them uh, almost a month to chase that little uh, trespasser out of their territory. And they have defended their territory like that ever since. Um, yeah, not all gray foxes defend their territory uh, as, as adamantly as um, Limos and uh, uh, Big Eyes. Some of them are much more tolerant, allow other gray foxes to live right side by side. And uh, so it varies. But this whole canine distemper, is this something that lingers in the environment? Is this something that can be picked up by, by the new foxes that have moved in? Um, yeah, um, I, I asked the uh, state veterinarian uh, th that very question, where did it come from? And she said, nobody knows. Uh, she said, but, but it seems to be endemic to uh, California uh, because she said, I get dieouts happening across the state of California uh, two to three every single year. She said, she added to that though, not as many as you had. She said, it's usually five, six, seven uh, foxes die of uh, canine distemper and uh, it sort of wipes itself out of the system and that's it. Mm -hmm. But we had 25. Wow, that's a big number. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It almost put a halt on my study of the of the foxes, but I knew with no foxes in the area, I knew that some fox, one or a pair of foxes would find that empty space and claim it for their own. And that's why I kept the cameras running. Uh all, all the way through that two years and one month. Because mm -hmm. I, I was confident that I was going to get at least a pair to come back in and claim the territory. And that's exactly what happened. I was ecstatic when I saw those two on, on the uh, trail cameras that one morning. I, I went, oh my God, there they are. There they're back. <laughs> There's finally a couple back. Yeah. That was great, yes. Um, if anyone wishes to write a check to support the Urban Wildlife Research Project, there's an address right here, 4318 Collins Court, number nine in Mountain View, California, to, support, to support the project. So uh -huh. uh, consider that or purchasing of the book. Um, and then I believe that Bill has a little extra tidbit of information that he can relate to us regarding the sighting of a beaver. Oh, yeah. Well, in, tw in 20, 2022, I got a tip from a person um, that I casually knew. Uh, and he said, you know, I think I saw a beaver. Uh, down on Matadero Creek. And so um, I said, well, um, where did you see this? And he took me to the, to the location. I put a trail camera in there. And three days later, I had a beaver appearing, coming out of the creek, past the trail camera, and then going back down into the creek and swimming away. That one, that was just a single um, beaver. It was not until September, uh, yeah, it was September of 2022 that I caught two beavers and it was obvious that they were male and female. And so 
I let the appropriate people know uh, that we had uh, a pair of beavers on Matadero Creek. And uh, so um, everybody was saying, okay, if it's really a pair, we're going to have um, little uh, beavers, little beavers, baby beavers <laughs> in, in, in April. And so um, April comes along and I get a bunch of questions about, well, you see any baby beavers out there? And I had to say no. But one morning, it was August 24th, I was going through the files here uh, on my computer and uh, I saw running across in front of camera four, I saw this little thing that I had never seen before. I, I mean, I, I was baffled as to what, what it was. And uh, so I, couldn't I couldn't tag it. I didn't know what it was. And somewhere along the way in my thinking and watching over and over and over this little beaver going across in front of camera four, I thought, I wonder, is that maybe a baby beaver? And so I took the I took the file, I sent it to my friend uh, Heidi. Uh, Perryman, and she's a she's a beaver expert, okay. And uh, Heidi came back about a half an hour later, and she said, "Me and John both think that is a baby beaver." And from there, when she made that declaration, I uh, sent it to a friend of mine, Rick Landman, and to uh, another. Uh, acquaintance. Uh, she's a journalist here in Palo Alto. Um, and uh, so I sent, sent them both that. Um, she, she got back in touch with me right away and said, I want to do an article on this and I want to post it tomorrow morning. Uh, so we chatted a little bit about it. She wrote up an, a brief article uh, that appeared in the, uh, what was it? Palo Alto Weekly, Palo Alto Online. And um, by 10 o'clock in the morning, I had an email in my box uh, from uh, ABC Television Channel 7. They wanted to have permission to use that little uh, video clip and they, I gave them permission to do that. Uh, from there, it went. Uh, it, it, the, 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 the article uh, went national, and then international. And I spent about a month dealing with the media on this little um, baby uh, beaver. That baby beaver was the first beaver to be uh, to uh, to be born on that creek in over 160 years. And that's that part. That's what made the news. Not that there was a baby beaver born, but uh, a baby beaver had not been born in that channel for over 160 years. The last beaver to be documented in uh, Silicon Valley, Santa Clara Valley, or Santa Clara County, was in 1855. It was trapped and killed on Quito Creek. So that's what made the news. Oh, that's, that's the scoop, people. <laughs> Thank you. That was the latest scoop. And we will have a beaver program in February. Heidi will be with us to give us a wonderful presentation on beavers. Yeah. For the friends. She's great. So uh um so Bill, thank you so so much.
I think we have to give you a rest because we've we've pushed you way beyond the hour and we certainly appreciate so much how much you've presented and explained and shown to us through both word and video and pictures and it's just been a fascinating fascinating talk and lecture so thank you so so much on behalf of everyone we it was a stupendous evening thank you thank you thank you uh, thank you <laughs> yeah. right, so I'll I'll end this presentation the the webinar right now. Okay. And, uh, say good night, everyone, and I'll be in touch shortly. Good night. Right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you for staying with us. Mm -hmm.